I invite you to turn with me to the book of James. We are in James chapter 4. The title of the sermon is called The Cure for Worldliness. So let's give attention to the reading of God's Word. We'll go ahead and begin in verse 1 for context. But the primary area of our passage will be verses 6 to 10. It says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. He says, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. This is God's holy and inspired word. May he add his blessing to it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we are thankful that we can be here today, that we can hear your word declare, that we can sing you praises in light of this great salvation that you have given us, Lord. Help us then to be alert today, to comprehend what you have to say, illumine our minds to understand. Help us to not have any worldly distractions amongst us and focus on the means that you have given us here today to cherish you, to grow all in you as we seek to grow into the image of Christ. We pray pray in his name. Amen. As we've been studying, uh, James has been talking to us about the need for the cure of worldliness. James is writing uh, the book of James here to equip believers to become mature in the faith, to exhibit true faith and and not be self-deceived. And James is concerned that the Christian keeps his eyes focused on Christ to not exhibit worldliness. The more we look to the world, the more we're going to look like the world. So the Christian's called to look different because he's looking to Christ ultimately and seeing him through his word. And James told us earlier, one of his concerns in light of a Christian having true faith is that they keep themselves unstained from the world. Worldliness can do great damage to a believer's life in Christ. And just before that, in chapter 3, he hammered the contrast between godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. Godly wisdom is the wisdom that seeks to do what is pure, what is right, what also produces peace. But worldly wisdom is that which is produced by pride and selfish ambition. It results in conflict and disorder. And it's not from God, but is from Satan. So he hears about conflicts in the midst of the church that he has been writing to. He is writing to believers who have been scattered, who once were members of his church. He's writing to them, and he sees that there's evidences of the system, symptoms of a great disease, the disease of worldliness. He sees conflicts, he sees trials, and he wants to write to them so they can, one, see it. He also wants to rebuke them in the midst of it to see the seriousness of worldliness, that you can't be a friend of the world and a friend of God. But then he also doesn't want to just leave them there. He wants to give them the cure. And so that's what we see here in our passage today, is the cure for worldliness. Those who truly belong to Christ will seek to rid themselves of worldliness. And today, he shows us the means to do that. So the big idea we have here is because we are in Christ— and have the Spirit within us, we have the ability to humbly turn and submit to God, to be cleansed from the stain of worldliness as he gives us grace. So we're going to see this, the keys to the cure of worldliness. Three main keys, but we're going to see one of them is uh, more pronounced. 
know the diagnosis. So we'll briefly review that. But then we're going to see, understand the nature of humility. Understand the nature of humility. And as we see, this is broken up into several commands that he lists. We can sum it up this way. Submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to God, be cleansed, and repent. But all this happens not in a vacuum. All this happens not because you're pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. It happens as you look to Christ. So let's briefly consider, by way of review, the diagnosis. In verse 1, he begins and says, What causes these quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? Your passions are at war within you. You desire, you do not have, so you murder. You covet, you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spin it on your passions. So again, as we said, James here sees the symptoms of the disease of worldliness, and it comes in the form of disorder, chaos, and conflict. And he sees that there's conflict among the people of God. Remember, these are people whom he has been calling brothers. He's not writing to the world here. He's writing to the church who is at conflict with one another. And he asks him, Why, what is the source of this conflict? Why is this happening in your midst? Is it not this? He says, your passions are at war within you. Your desires are at war. Your, your lusts are at war within you. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You have created things in your life that you want so bad that you're willing to go to war with your fe fellow brother in Christ over it. And so often when we think of these desires, we can think of things that are bad and, and lustful and, and fleshly and sinful. And sure, those definitely are the case. We can desire bad things. And when we don't get those pleasures or desires, we can definitely grow in anger and conflict. But even so, as we saw, this word, these words here emphasize the intensity of that desire. We can desire something so much. It could even be good things that we desire that they then become idols, that when we don't get what people, uh, what we want, that people are hindering us from, we can take it out on them. We can then become jealous. We can have selfish ambition. And James is saying this is the diagnosis of worldliness. It's taken root in your heart and in your mind. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 14, if you have bitter jealousy, self and ambition in your heart, do not boast, boast and be false to the truth. Don't lie to yourself, he says. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. He says, I see this in your midst. I see this, and is it not this? It's because of you and your own desires. Right? It takes two to tango. We all have our own fleshly desires. Before we look at the faults of others, he says, look at yourself. Godly wisdom is that which is pure, that which is pursuing peace. He says, I see this symptom of worldliness. So he wants them to see the seriousness, the danger of this worldliness that he sees within them. And he says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. He says, do you see the seriousness of this? Friendship with the world is choosing to be opposed to God. If you seek to be a friend of the world, you're choosing to be God's enemy. You're welcoming his opposition. It, you can't wed the two. They're antithetical to each other. You are committing spiritual adultery, right? He uses this sharp language. And again, he's not talking to the world. He's talking to the church, believers who have allowed worldliness to creep in. They profess faith, but then they look like the world. They profess they know Jesus, that they've been washed by the blood of the Lamb, yet they're murdering and hating one another. Not in a literal sense of murder, but if you're angry with your brother, you've committed, what, murder in your heart, Jesus says. He says, you are committing spiritual adultery. See this weight, see the seriousness of this. You are running to another lover. And God is your husband. He says, do you not suppose that so no purpose that the scriptures say he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? This worldliness is producing in you a disregard to the scriptures, in other words. The scriptures are very plain. God is jealous for you. He wants you to be fully devoted to him. 
And as a result of you being a friend with the world, you are bringing on the jealousy of God. And you should already know that, that he saved you for his purpose. He put his spirit in you as a down payment of his love for you. But when you go and be a friend with the world, when you exhibit selfish ambition and pride, you're looking more like the world than you're looking like Christ. And as a result, you're neglecting what the scripture says. Do you just say, okay, well, yeah, God's a jealous God. So what? I'll do what I want. He says, no, you're neglecting the scriptures. So if you want to have an accurate view of who God is and what your sin is, you need to reorientate yourself and allow the scriptures to inform your mind once again, not the world. He says, how can you prostitute yourself to the world when you are wed to Christ? So he wants us to recognize that worldliness is opposition to God. It is a dangerous disease that must be cured. Right? If you went, went into the, uh, the doctor's office one day and he gave you a theory about, hey, here's, here's a book about cancer. I think it'd be helpful for you to read it. You might be thinking, okay, well, that's one thing. I can know about cancer. But if the doctor sits down with you and says, you have cancer, you have six months to live, this is what we need to do. I'm sure you would take the seriousness of that uh, a whole lot more seriously and want to put it into practice right away because it's a matter of life and death. And that's what James is saying. This is a dangerous disease. You need the cure. You need the cure for this right away. Do not delay. So he wants us to show us the cure, and it comes by understanding the nature of humility. Look at verse 6. It says, but... He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So here he gives us a ray of hope. God gives more grace. What is grace? Grace is, we can define as unmerited favor. It's post-fall, we can more accurately describe it as demerited favor. It's favor we are getting when we deserve the exact opposite. He gives us grace. We deserve his wrath. We have rebelled, we have sinned, we've broken his law. Wrath is what we deserve, but what does God give us? He gives us love, grace, and life, and forgiveness. Grace, God gives more grace. God is an abundant of grace. And so the hope for sinners, the hope for those who are seeking to be worldliness, is to recognize the grace of God and that there's forgiveness in Him. Allow that grace to motivate you to renounce this sin, to rid yourself of this worldliness. God only gives grace. He gives grace to us to pardon our sin. He gives grace to us by applying the work of Christ to us, by grace through faith in Christ. In Christ, all our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, because he gives more grace. Ephesians 2 says this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. The fact that God showers you with grace and that there's abundant grace doesn't mean you are to continue in sin. He says God gives you more grace, but because of that, don't let that motivate you to just say, well, I'll just sin it up. I'll just continue in my worldly mentality. Romans 6, Paul says, for sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to life and righteousness? So who are you a friend of? Who are you obeying? Are you a friend of the world? Are you obeying its its, uh, morals and its message? Or are you a friend of God and obeying his word? You have been bought with a price. You have been showered with grace. Now out of gratitude, show that by the way you live. Fight against worldliness. Fight against this sin that is in your life. He gives more grace. So right there, he's showing us the cure doesn't start by you trying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. It starts by him showering you with more grace. He gives us more grace. He gives us grace not only in forgiving us our sin, 
But he also gives us grace by enabling us then to do what he says. That is a grace. He enables us to be able to live according to his commandments. That can only be possible if you have been regenerated and you have the spirit of Christ dwelling in you. You now have the ability to fight sin. Before that, in our own strength, you were completely unable. You were dead in sin. But by his Holy Spirit, he gives us more grace. He enables us to bring about the fruit of the salvation that we have. As a result, who gets the glory? He does. It's not you who did all this. He's enabling you to do all this. He's empowering you. Therefore, he gets the glory. Ephesians 2 says it this way, For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the whole reason he gives us grace, he saves us, but he also gives us grace to walk according to our salvation that he's given us. We are led by the Spirit. He's enabling us with grace to perform what we were created to do. Paul says it this way in Titus 2, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. It's God's enabling grace. He gives more grace to enable you to do what he says. And James is hammering this fact because he's going to command different things. But as he commands these things, as he pronounces the cure, as he gives the steps for the cure, he wants you to know, I'm not just telling you, pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. Do it out of your own strength. As you look to Christ, as you are relying on the grace that he provides, you can do these. But if we refuse to denounce worldliness, what are you doing? You're rejecting his grace. So he says, therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So one of the biggest forms of pride is if you seek to be a friend of the world. If you seek to be a friend of the world, what are you doing? You're rejecting God's word. You're saying, you know what, God, I know better than you. I know you say this is enmity with God, but it's really not that bad, is it? I can do this. You're, you are making yourself judge, and you are judging whether what God's word says is true or not. That's the ultimate form of pride. Pride is opposition to God. Pride is rebellion. Pride keeps us from being obedient. It keeps us from admitting when we're wrong. Pride keeps us from seeking God's help and his instruction. The more and more we're humbled, the more and more God showers us with his grace. And it's the grace of God that he would convict us of the sins of worldliness and show us where we are wrong. And it's his grace that brings that about. And he supplies us with the grace to do what he requires of us. But if we allow that pride to remain, if we allow to remain in worldliness, pride hinders you from receiving more grace. He says, if you want grace, humble yourself. Repent. Admit that being a friend of the world is wrong. Seek to please God. You can't flirt with the world and seek to be a friend of God. They're in opposition to one another. So now, what James does here is he wants to elaborate on what humility looks like, on what being humble looks like. If you want grace, right, you see you're at odds with God, you're in opposition, you're in sin, you're welcoming his resistance by being a friend of the world, you need grace. He gives grace to the humble. So then the question is, how do you be humble? And he wants us to know the nature of humility so you can follow these steps so that God can produce in you true spirit-led humility. And here we see, I'm going to call a humility sandwich. The humility sandwich. Look at verse 6. Here's what we can say is the bread. 
It's the idea of being humble. The idea of being humble. Go down to verse 10. What do we see again? The command to be humble. So what follows in between, these are commands, are meant to direct us to the idea of what it means to be humble. This is the nature of humility. These are the steps we are to take as we're led by the Spirit. And as we do these things, He brings us more grace. But it happens with a promise. Maybe you're here and you recognize, man, I feel God's distant. Man, I feel kind of down. Doesn't mean, all right, just do better, try harder. Try to just read your Bible more. Try to just pray more. No, the promise is if you humble yourself, if you go through God's providential means that he gives you, if you follow these steps, what's the promise at the end of verse 10? He will exalt you. He will lift you up. He will restore you to true spiritual health. God is the one who draws us back. God is the one to have us renounce worldliness. When you manifest the fruit of the Spirit, he says, it shows you truly belong to him. When you see the fruit of humility, it's a testament that he's worked it in you. Again, this isn't a, okay, just be humble. It's not a, okay, well, God saved me, so I'm just going to let go and let God. It's God's work, but what does it mean? That you're active. So God provides the means. Our responsibility is to follow the steps. And the promise is, he will lift us up. He will exalt us. So let's consider the steps or the nature, these aspects of humility. Because we all want more grace, but it's the humble who gets grace. Notice the first step of being humble. Verse 7, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. This therefore here is connecting the thought of the previous verse. Since God gives more grace, since he gives it to the humble, not the pride, prideful, therefore, if you want that grace, it starts by submitting to God. Submit yourselves to God. What does that mean? Well, submitting yourself to God is very comprehensive. It can mean many things as we understand in Scripture. But this word for submit means to put yourself under, to be subordinate, right? It's a, it's a military term. When you have a, a commander, we are those who are to submit underneath. You are to willingly submit to Christ. Submit to God. This means, first of all, submitting to his rule and authority over you. He's the king. You are not. We need to live our lives like he is in charge. When we don't submit to his authority and rule over us, that is the ultimate form of pride. It's to say, no, God, I'm on the throne. I'm in charge. This is the first step to being humble is admit you're not. That he's the king, that he is sovereign, that he is in charge, that he rules, that he is the king of kings and lord of lords. It means humbly submitting to him and his commands that he gives you in his word. It's the world that says, actually, you know, God's commands are, they're just they're to spoil your joy. They're, not to, they're, they're just not letting you have fun. They're burdensome. But it's God's word. That tells us, actually, his laws, his commandments are not burdensome, but they're a delight, right? We've been studying Psalm 119, and how much does a psalmist delight in the law of the Lord? The whole psalm. It's because he understands that that is the source of ultimate joy, is obedience to God. Even in the midst of hostility, persecution, and enemies coming at him, he can take joy in the, in the, in the word of the Lord. Sin says, I don't have to obey God. I can do what I want. I can do whatever feels right. But submitting to God means obeying him, even if it might mean hardship, even if it might mean it goes against what we want at the time. Obedience to God is more important than my pleasures. Obedience to God is more important than my happiness. Submission to God's commands are actually evidence that you belong to him. And if you don't obey his commands, it's evidence that you don't. 
Romans 8 says this, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Submitting to God means humbly submitting also to those whom he has placed in authority over you. Because that's what his word says. You cannot say, hey God, I'm in submission to you, but you don't respect or obey those whom he's placed over you in authority. Who might that be? Well, we can just give a list. Government, husbands, parents, employers, your church leaders, those who are in authority over you, as long as they're in submission to God, when they fail to be in submission to God and to his word, they don't have any authority over you. It also means humbly submitting in his way of salvation. There's only one way of salvation, but the world wants to say, you know what, just be good enough. Just try your best. All roads lead to God, but the Bible tells us there's only one way of salvation. It's not by your works. It's not by your cooperation with his grace. It comes solely by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. It commands us we're to repent of our sins. We're to submit. We're to rest fully in him. And then we are to exhibit the good works of salvation as the evidence or the fruit of salvation, not the cause of it. Being united to Christ, now you have the desire and the ability to submit to God. You cannot submit to God if you're dead in sin. So you must submit to his way of salvation, which only comes by grace through faith in Christ. And having started in that way, Christians can at times be forgetful. Having started in that way of salvation, we can allow the message of the world to take root in our hearts. We can live by pride. We can be distracted. So true believers, if they are wayward, the call is resubmit to God. It starts there. If God gives grace to the humble, if you want to be humble, admit God's in charge, not you. And you will be obedient to what he says. So first we're to submit. Notice the next command. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So rather than being a friend of the world, rather than being in opposition to God, resist the devil. Because it's the world that is the devil's system, the devil's message. Now remember the order here. We all want to get up and fight the devil, right? But you cannot resist the devil if you have not first submitted to God. We must first bow the knee to Christ, or it's impossible to resist the devil. He has dominion over you. But we must bow the knee to Christ, submit to him, and only then can you resist the devil. To resist means to oppose, to treat as an enemy and not your friend. And so a believer is to resist the devil, to treat him as your enemy. The devil is one of the many names for Satan. So... To resist the devil doesn't mean you go out searching for him. Oh, the devil's under every rock. Let me go search out for him. To resist the devil doesn't mean you perform all these extravagant things like exorcisms. To resist means he's advancing towards you, but you are to oppose his advancement. We are called to resist the advancement of the devil whatever he might try to make you lure into sin, to entrap you, to entice. And when you do that, there's a promise. Notice the promise. And he will flee from you. So if we're going to resist the devil, we need to know our enemy. We need to know his tactics. We know that the scripture says that he's a personal being whom God cre created, who is proud and in rebellion to God. He hates God. He refuses to submit to him as Lord. The Bible calls him a liar. He's a murderer from the beginning. He is like a lion seeking to whomever to devour. In the church, he seeks to bring about division. He seeks to provoke us to anger. Ephesians 4, Paul actually says, don't be angry. Um, don't allow the sun to go down on your anger. Be angry, don't sin. Don't give the devil an opportunity. When we're angry with one another, what we are doing is giving the devil an opportunity to divide. He wants to provoke that, us to anger, 
Satan wants men of God to separate. Satan wants to entice men to become their own authority, to not submit to God's prerogative. And that's exactly what he did with Adam and Eve, isn't it? He said, did God really say? You're your own authority. You decide what's right and wrong. He wants to make us a rebel. He promotes false teaching and error. He's the accuser. He wants to block the truth from your own lives. Maybe by giving you ideas of, or stigmas or whatever. I can't go to church because of this. I can't do this. I can't listen because of this. That's the devil giving a foothold in your life to prevent you from hearing the word of God. So repent. He is the accuser, and he wants to block the truth from your life. So how then do we resist now that we know who he is? Well, first, he's not this cartoon figure, you know, the devil. We live in a world where we tend to not believe much of the spiritual world. We believe only what we see, and so we treat the devil as just kind of this fictional cartoon character. Oh, he's a real being, and he will bring harm. But how do you resist? Well, turn with me to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 says there is true spiritual warfare that is happening that you must take seriously. In Ephesians 6, Paul is actually showing us, here is what you are to do. And it starts by putting on the armor. Finally, be strong in the Lord, verse 10, and in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Remember who your enemy is. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand and in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. So how do you resist the devil? His advances are coming at you. You stand firm, grounded in the word of God. You stand firm by putting on the armor of God. Don't become obsessed with all these extra biblical methods of resisting the devil. Stand. Put on the armor. We resist the devil by standing against error and false teaching and fighting for the truth. We resist the devil by worshiping God and not neglecting the means of grace. What you're doing here right now is warfare, and it's resisting the devil. Pray that God would help us recognize his advances. We stand upon the truth, and as we do that, we resist Satan's advances. The word of God is that sword, but it's a two-edged sword, isn't it? It can be used for defensive purposes, but also offensive purposes. The word of God, as you study it and know it, it reveals what? The lies of the devil, the twisting of scripture that he gives. But by that means, you have the ability to discern and identify those lies, the advances of the devil. You can identify those things that entice you to sin. Psalm 119, verse 11, I've stored up your word in my heart. Why? Why? so I may not sin against you. And exactly this is how Jesus resisted the devil, isn't it? When the devil came to tempt him in the wilderness, when he tried to twist the scriptures and lure uh, Jesus into falling, into not going through the cross, he said, I'll give you the glory now, just bow down to me. How did Jesus resist? It is written. He quoted scripture. He quoted the word of God. Why? Because he had it internal. He knew it. He understood it. He could identify the false teachings that Satan was giving and the temptations, and he was able to stand firm because he was rooted in the word of God. And as we too study the word of God, partake in the means of grace, we too can resist, and the promise is the devil will flee, just like he fled Christ. But he didn't flee them all together, right? He he came back to regroup. Came back for the next attack, but we have to be ready. Let's consider the next point. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So you are to turn away from Satan and in in turn, turn to God. Remember, what did he call these people in verse 4? You adulterous people, right? You adulterous people. So this is a call to come back to God. Stop being adulterers. Come back to God. Return to me, he says, and I will return to you. 
Here again, we see the command that comes with a promise. Draw near to God. And as you draw near, he will draw near to you. So seek him with all your heart. What is God after? What does the law summarize? Love God with all your what? Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? That's what God is after. But when you are friends with the world, your heart's divided. God delights us to come to him, to seek him with our whole heart, not a divided heart. We can only truly seek God because we know he's first sought us. He drew near to us and opened our eyes. He regenerated us. He gave us the spirit. He made us alive together with Christ. And because of that, you can now seek him. You should desire to seek him and grow in the knowledge of him. Isaiah 55 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. You adulterous people, come to God. Turn to God. Return to God. He's compassionate and he will pardon. In and of ourselves, we cannot draw near to God. In and of ourselves, we can't even get close to God because why? We are sinners. But because of the life, death, resurrection of Christ, he is the one who drew us near to God. So now we have all the confidence in the world to draw near to God ourselves. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might what? Bring us to God. Draw us near to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So Christ brings us near to God. We are welcomed in God's presence because we're united to Christ. So then we're to continually draw near. We're to continually come to the Lord. But Satan wants to prevent that. One person said, when God calls us to come near to him, he already shows us his love and grace. The initiative then belongs to God, not us. For this reason, we can never claim that because we first approached God, he came to us. God always acts first in the work of salvation. So how can we draw near to God? It doesn't just happen. It's not abracadabra. You must be active. You must be deliberate. It takes discipline. It takes effort. He draws us, but we are responsible to ask. Matthew 7 says, Ask, it will be given. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. It will be opened. We can draw near through prayer. We can draw near through Bible reading. We can draw near as we worship God. This phrase, draw near, actually comes from the idea of the Old Testament of the the priest drawing near to God. God, the Holy of Holies, by way of sacrifice. Today we come by God's prescribed means, by way of sacrifice, through the sacrifice of Christ, the once for all sacrifice. Therefore, we can draw near to worship God in prayer. Hebrews 10 brings this out. It says, therefore, brothers, since we've been, we have confidence to enter the holy place, to draw near by the blood of Jesus, By the new and living way he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. Since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Beloved, because you're united to Christ, you can boldly enter the throne room of grace. You can draw near to God and the promises. If you do that, if you have effort, if you strive to be disciplined in these things, the promise is he will draw near to you. There is blessing there. And the thing is, friends want to be close to each other. Friends want to be near each other. But if you don't seek to be near to God, what does that say about you? He says, you're a friend of the world? You want to be with the world rather than be with God's people? What does that say about you? Actively draw near because he's your friend. You you ought to prefer God as your friend than friendship with the world. When we neglect drawing near to God, it's no surprise we feel distant. But that's only because we have drawn away from him. So he says, actively draw near. 
He desires you to come to him. Christ has paved the way. Don't neglect it. Draw near to God comes with the marvelous promise that he will draw near to you. He will. Not maybe, not possibly, he will. As we draw near to God, he pours more grace. He blesses us by being near to us. Psalm 145 says this, The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. So the more you draw near to God, the more and more you're satisfied with him. You want to long with, long for him. You want to see him in the word. In corporate worship, God is drawing you near to him right now. He blesses you by feeding you with the word, by communion and fellowship and prayer. And as we experience these things, he is working through these means to bless you. As you pray for one another, as you pray to God, you get the blessing of having to participate in these things and God working through those means and you can see him at work. But you neglect to draw near to God. You're neglecting the very graces he gives you to grow your faith. As we seek him, he promises we'll find him and he will bless and reward us. So look at the next step. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double minded. Again, James is calling those who are part of his church, whom he's called brothers, you sinners. It might seem harsh, but what he's doing is using prophetic language to have them bring about the repentance of sin. He's saying you're not walking according to what you profess. Positionally, you're one who's cleansed. You've been showered of grace. You've been purified by the work of Christ. Therefore, walk according to that. Now, in and of ourselves, we cannot cleanse our hands. We cannot do this ourselves. It's Christ who cleanses us. He purifies us. How? With his blood, right? We just sang it. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so if we want to be cleansed, it's a call to run to him. Continually confess. It is Christ who cleanses and purifies us with his blood. One person said, because we have been cleansed and purified by Christ, we each have a responsibility to strive at becoming, in reality, what Christ has already made you positionally. So positionally, we have been washed clean, but we still have the remnants of the lingering flesh. We still have the staining of our hands. And so when we are caught, like he says, you adulterous people, you're being a friend of the world. When you're caught with that, repent, cleanse your hands, turn to Christ be washed. First John 1, 6 says, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in darkness as he is in the, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse your hands. You have to turn to Christ for that. This uh, cleansing of hands refers to externally, to forsake sin that you're doing. It's language of ceremonial cleansing in the Old Testament. And the hands were that which were symbols of one's outward deeds, the deeds of his hands. So he says, I see your hands are full of sin. Well, cleanse them. Confess your sin. Forsake your sin. Don't just confess and go right back to doing it again. Confess. Repent. Turn. Make use of Jesus. Cleanse yourself with his blood. Confess your sins to him. Isaiah 1.16 says, When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers. I will not listen because your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil from your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. So the command to cleanse yourself, to wash your hands, is to stop doing evil. Repent. Turn to Christ. He also says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. So not only are you cleansed outwardly, also you need to be cleansed inwardly in your thoughts the motivations and desires of your heart. It's a call to examine the attitudes of your heart. Why do you do the things you do? Psalm 119, verse 9, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. We are called for purity. 
not just in the things we do, but in the things we think. How do you maintain purity in the mind? By keeping it according to the word. We are called to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but when we don't do when we love the world, we have a divided heart, a dirty heart that needs cleansing. We need to repent. And this is just double mindedness. So our minds need to be recalibrated to repent of the worldliness, to have the thoughts centered on Christ, turning to him in faith and repentance. First John 3 says, Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. And so if we are to have our minds that are purified, we need to think upon godly things. We need to not let the message of the world bombard us and tempt us and convince us that those things are true, which are contrary to the word of God. That's why he says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, commendable or excellent, anything praiseworthy, think of those things. Saturate your mind with those things. He brings us to the next step. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. So James, once again, is employing this Old Testament prophetic language here. Grieving, mourning, weeping. And James is saying, you need to really grieve over your sin. You need to see it for what it is, an offense against the holy and righteous God of the universe who saved you. Worldliness is sin. You must mourn over it. You must grieve over it. Take it seriously, he says. To mourn, it means to outwardly grieve. It's not just feel bad about it, but show you're sorrowful over it. To weep means to shed tears. And in biblical times, we know that when someone significant died, what did they do? They hired professional weepers or mourners. And what was that supposed to communicate? That, man, this person was very important to me. This is a great loss, and I am sorrowful over this. And so they publicly displayed and weeping and mourning and having this show about it. And so God is saying, I want you to take seriously your sin. I want you to see your waywardness, your worldliness, and see it how serious it is and weep and mourn over it. One person said the desire for a pure heart leads logically to a sorrow for sin. When sin is manifest, a, the righteous grieve. When we see sin well up in our own hearts, that ought to provoke grief. Paul exhibited this kind of grief, right? When he's wrestling with the sin of the flesh and what he wants to do, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. When Peter gave in, what happened to him? He wept bitterly. It's godly grief. When was the last time you wept over your sin? Do you see your sin as a major affront to God or just something that's, eh, it's no big deal? We'd all do good to have times to just reflect on our own actions, to see the different things that we do and, and the, the really how much God despises those things. And that should provoke us to mourn over it, but also help us to refrain from continuing in it. He says this, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. These are similar words that Jesus spoke in Luke 6. He says, woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Speaking to the Pharisees. James, uh, one person said this, James says, we can laugh now at sin and mourn later over judgment. Or we can mourn now over sin and laugh later at God's grace. All too often the world laughs about the wrong things. There is fleeting joy for those who indulge in sin and fleeting sorrow for those who break with it. But it is far better to mourn now for a season and rejoice forever. The world says it's no big deal and laughs at sin. Worldly attitude is happy to please yourself, to do whatever feels right. Rather, it takes joy in worldly pursuits James is saying you ought to mourn, you ought to weep 
And may your joy that you have over your worldliness, may that be turned to gloom. Grieve over your sin. See it as an offense to the God you love. Jesus said this um, for those who see it this way. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It is a good thing to mourn over sin, to see it for what it is. Why? Because when you do that, you recognize, I am nothing. I am a worm. But then, that's one of the keys to humility. It starts by seeing you for who you are and hating the sin that remains. And then we see this in verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. James gets back to the bread of the humility sandwich. And he says, this is the aspects of the nature of humility. He returns to the promise. The lowly will be exalted. The exalted will be brought low. This promise, this proverb we see throughout the Old Testament. And he gives a command, humble yourself. In light of this, humble yourself. Now, in the Greek here, this could be a passive voice, meaning the action is done to you, meaning God will humble you. But it, in the same tense, it can also be in a middle voice, meaning you're doing this action. Now, context reveals which it is, but in this case, either can be true. So it could be read, God will humble you. And sometimes God does humble us. He'll bring trials, he'll bring discipline, and part of that humbling is to accept it knowing it's coming from God, knowing that he is doing it for our good, and in time, he will lift us up. He will bring about repentance. But sometimes we need to humble ourselves. Stop seeking to be first. Consider others more significant than yourself. Seek to serve rather than be served. And that only comes by humbling ourselves. But the promise is also there. He will exalt you in due time. Jesus said this in Matthew 23, The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. These are the steps to the nature of humility. God gives more grace to the humble. Therefore, pursue them. Psalm 149, For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. One, one person who really understood this well is Peter. Peter sinned grievously, didn't he? He denied the Lord three times. He had a good response by weeping bitterly over it. And he was sorrowful. But in time, the Lord used that to grow him, to humble him. And Peter, Peter can now write this in 1 Peter 5, 6. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. That's Peter, who was humbled greatly. And in the end, he was, he was lifted up. He was restored as he humbly repented, confessed. And now God's using him to write scripture and impact the church. God gives grace to the humble. Another one we're reminded of this is David, aren't we? If you remember David's life, he sinned. And he had a grievous sin. He became a friend of the world. He sought to please himself and his lustful passions. But David had to be humbled. And as you see that process that David had, he had to resubmit to God's sovereign rule. He had to resist the devil from further spiraling into giving into his temptations. He had to seek to be further drawn near to God by attaining that through prayer and worship in his word. He had to confess and forsake his sins. He mourned and grieved over them. Just read most of the Psalms, you see that. And when he returned to that place of humility, when God worked humbleness in him, he showered him with grace, and what happened? He restored him. But most of all, as you consider these things, it should help you see Jesus. Because most of all, all these commands you cannot do without looking to him. He is the perfect embodiment of these things. It is impossible for us to do them in and of our own strength. He was humility personified. He was the one who, through humility, was exalted. As we look to him, we're enabled to also be humble. And as we read in our scripture reading, in Psalm, I mean, 
uh, Philippians 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look to his own, not to his own interest, but the interest of others. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to list, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality of God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He became a servant. He humbled himself. He went to the cross. He suffered and died for you. He gave his very life for you. And in the end, he was exalted. Jesus perfectly exhibited submission to God. He submitted to the will of the Father, even if it meant suffering and hardship for him. He said, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but what? The will of him who sent me. He perfectly resisted the devil. He said the reason the Son of Man came was to destroy the works of the devil. One of the most difficult circumstances, he was tempted in the wilderness. He overcame by knowing the word of God, and he successfully resisted the devil. But not only that, he was obedient all the way to the point of death. And it's through death that he crushed the head of the serpent, the devil. Jesus defeated Satan, and because of that, we're able to resist him for us who are in Christ. Well, on earth, Jesus constantly sought to draw near to God. You read the Gospels, and he's continually trying to take, uh, separate himself and spend time alone with God in prayer. He meditated on the Word so that he can internalize it. He sought to worship. He honored the Sabbath. He regularly attended those things. He fed on the Word of God. He cherished the Word of God, and he actually taught it. Why? So he would bring others near to God. And ultimately, he brings people near to God through his life, death, and resurrection. And though he never had to cleanse his hands, though he never had to to purify his heart, because he was sinless his entire life. But he did that not for his sake, but for ours. Because we are not clean, he became the sinless sacrifice so that we can have cleansed hands and a clean heart. And he rightly mourned over sin. Not for his own, but for ours. Jesus was a man of sorrows. Isaiah 53 says he was acquainted with grief. He bore the sorrows on the cross. He wept over sin and its effects for the world. And as a result, for us who united him by faith, he turns our weeping to what? Joy. And he was the one who was humbled all his life and was exalted, and is now King of kings and Lord of lords, and he set before you a pattern. Suffering precedes glory. Humility precedes exaltation. Therefore, look to him. Be humble. Enjoy fellowship and nearness with God rather than with this world. Repent. Wash your hands as you look to Christ. So as we close, what does your life say about you? Who are you a friend with? Is it the world, or is it with God? Maybe you're here and you feel distant. You feel, man, I don't feel God's presence like I used to. Well, he provides the means, the remedy. Humble yourself. Follow these steps that we discussed and look to Christ. And there is abundant grace and mercy available to those who humble themselves. The promise is he will exalt you. Maybe you're here, you don't even know God. You recognize how can I do any of this? Well, the thing about this is God graciously still invites every sinner to draw near to him, to not resist, to resist his rebellion. And the promise is God will elevate those who bow down to him. Right now, he is patient, allowing you to submit, allowing you to voluntarily follow him. But those who refuse to draw near will experience everlasting separation from God. And so the plea is repent, draw near while you still can. He is gracious and loving God. So because we're in Christ and we have the spirit in us, we have the ability to humbly turn and submit to God to be cleansed from the stain of worldliness as he gives us the grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this and At times we can hear these things and just think, man, this is a bunch of law. And Lord, it is in and of itself. But for us who are united to Christ, 
This is the third use of the law. It is showing us what Christ has done for us and how then we, out of love and gratitude, can seek to do these things. Lord, help us to renounce the worldliness that it remains in our lives. Help us to see our sin for what it is, to weep and mourn over it, and to bring it to Christ, to cleanse our hands, to purify our hearts, so we can continually draw near to you and out of love and gratitude seek to love you, serve you, and obey you in all we say and do. In Christ's name, amen.